cameras than people. Well, <laughs> <laughs> There's more viewers online than there is. His attention to detail is unbelievable. I mean, he's not doing a bris mila. There was one time a rabbi came to the shiur, and all the guys, they couldn't come to the shiur, so they bought their recorders. So you see on the table, there's 100 recorders. So the next week he came, he bought a recorder of his own, he put it over there, he pushed play, he walked out. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so he had a recorder talking to a recorder. <laughs> Ready, Ami? I can hear, Rabbi. You can hear? I don't know why I can hear. It's okay, weird. that's weird, let's see. Here? Not too, we'll do it, let's see. <coughs> uh, it's because I'm on mute. It's hard to hear when I'm on mute. That's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the technology there. I, to, I was checking to see if my mute works. It works. <laughs> it works. I wish I could mute some of the members, but that's another discussion. Recording in progress. Okay, one more time. Okay, Rabbi, we're good. All right, Bukir Ola Botai. We're in Parashat Teruma. <coughs> and uh, we're going to be in Mishkan related Parashiyot practically to the end of the book of, uh, of Shemot. Shemot is called Sefer HaGeula. That's what the Ramban calls it. Sefer HaGeula, for good reason, the primary uh, event that takes up the first half of the book is the exodus of Egypt, and uh, which is the key. However, one may question then, what does Sefer Geula have to do with the building of the Mishkan? Uh, I would have put it probably in the book of Vayikra. Vayikra is more korbanot, you know, the the technicalities of the service and things like that, although uh, it would make Vayikra much longer than it already is, I don't think they were doing it just to keep the uh, sefarim, you know, equally balanced. No difference how long a sefer it is. A sefer Torah has the same, the same weight, no matter how you... Uh... So then the question then is, what is it doing here? And the Mepharshim explained is because the, Geula, the Ramban says this in his Hakdama. Very important Hakdama of the Ramban to Sefer Shemot. He says... The Geula is not complete until we return back to the way it was in the times of the Avot. That means we had, you know, a, a period of time of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the Imahot, and that was considered, you know, the Gan uh, Eden. Uh, that was the best time for the for the Jewish people. Not, not too many Jewish people. Maybe that's why it was the best time. But the point is that, you know, the homes of the Avot were considered Merkava Shechina. You went into Abraham's house and you saw miracles on a daily basis. So they said I would bake the challah on Friday without using preservatives. And uh, you came a week later and the challah is still fresh and it's still moist and maybe it was still even uh, warm. Now that's an open miracle. She would like the Nero Shabbat on Friday, and uh, you came a week later, and you had Nes Hanukkah, the, the Nero is still lit. And if you walked by Avraham Abinu's home, you would see a cloud of glory over the house. Mm-hmm. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. He wants people to live a lifestyle where he can be uh, resting in their, in their homes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world not so he could be upstairs and we could be downstairs. He wants the people to create an abode uh, for God to rest amongst us. Like the Midrash writes, Shehakadosh Baruch Hu mit'aveh liyot lo dira betachtonim. Bari Olam craves that he should have a, a dwelling, that he should have occupancy betachtonim. 
To live with the angels, it's easy to live with the angels. They, they didn't do anything to deserve it. Angels are angels, you know. To live with the Shamayim, that's the Chokmah. But to turn earth into Shamayim, that's what a Kadosh Baruch Hu desires. And until Avraham Abinu came, nobody was really able to make the world a, a, a suitable and habitable place for the Shekhinah. As a matter of fact, until Avraham, all the world was doing actually was chasing a Kadosh Baruch Hu away from the world. You know, when God created Adam, he was there. God was walking uh, with Adam and Rishon in Gan Eden. But then as the generations uh, uh, regressed, as we call the degeneration, uh, they were degenerates. Every single subsequent generation would happen. Bore Olam said, ah, I got to go back upstairs. And he went one level at a time until by the time you got to uh, Avraham Abinu's generation, the Rambam writes, you know, it was almost... Uh, it was almost if there was no spirituality left in the world, and Bari Olam was back on the, uh, in heaven, and the purpose of the world was undone. Again, Hashem made the world, why? In order that he should make, we should make a place that's fit for Kadar Baruch to live. Nobody was fulfilling that purpose until Avraham Abinu came. And Avraham Abinu turned the elevator from going up to going down. And all of a sudden, Avraham Abinu Alav Hashem starts to bring the Shekhinah down. And they call it Merkava the Shekhinah. Merkava means he was a, a, a vehicle, a chariot, in order that the Shekhinah can rest. And he taught that tradition to Yitzhak. When Yitzhak Abinu went into uh, the tent uh, with Rivka Imenu, the Pasuk says he had consolation. What was his consolation? He saw all the miracles that happened in his mother's tent happen in his new wives tent, the Rivka's tent. And the same thing with Yaakov Abinu and the Imahot. So, after Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov reached that level of uh, the purpose of the world, I'm sorry to tell you, the world then went into degeneracy, degeneracy again. Until you got to the level when the Jewish people were in Mitzrayim, and forget about the 49th level of Tum'ah, and the Shekhinah went back up. So, it's like, Olim V'yoredim. So we had to get back to that level. So even though we came out of Mitzrayim, that's not the uh, end of the game. So we came out of Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim got down, but now what? Where's the Shekhinah? That, that's no end game to have the Jewish people out of Egypt and God still seven heavens all the way up and no uh, connection with the people. That's true. During Kiryat Yam Sufi came down for a quick uh, 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 revelation but then he went back up. So the Jews would have to make a, an abode. They would have to make a, a home where the Shekhinah can rest amongst them. And the Ramban says that abode was called Mishkan. Like it says in the Pasuk, Va'asudim Mishkan. Va'asudim Mikdash, whatever. Va'asudim Mikdash. Ve'shachanti betucham. Make for me a Mikdash and I will dwell in their midst. Betucho lo ne'emar, ela betucham. So the Mishkan was a great accomplishment. It brought, it, it brought the Shekhinah back down, deja vu. That's uh, French, the Rabbi will explain you that. <laughs> deja vu, what it was in the times of the Avot. So you hear the world reached a tikkun as it was in the times of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, where the main Shekhinah was in their homes, we were able to replicate it. Now the Geula is complete. Until we're able to bring the Shekhinah back down, what's the benefit if Mimitzrayim Ge'altanu, but Hashem is not the Geula. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still in exile, and the Jewish people are out of captivity, so what did we get? We got free, but the Shekhinah is not. So therefore, the book has two parts. The first part of the book of Shemot, which is called Sefer Geulah, talks about the Geulah of the people. Mm-hmm. And the second part of the book talks about the more important, the Geulah of the Shekhinah. That the Shekhinah now also was able to come out of its captivity and come back down. And we made a place, not only in the Mishkan, but obviously we had to be worthy that the Shekhinah can rest betucham amongst us. So hence the two parts of the book 
represent uh, an entire complete picture. The physical redemption out of Egypt and then the spiritual elevation to bring the world back to its uh, rectification, to the way it was in the times of the Avot and the Imam. That's just an int- by way of introduction to know exactly what Parashat Tiruma is doing here. Now, some of you tomorrow morning, you're going to think that there's more uh, uh, to the Exodus. The Exodus is over. There's no more mm-hmm. story. There's no 11th plague and there's no uh, uh, postscript. We're done with it. So tomorrow morning, you start reading about the Mishkan, you might say to yourself, well, what are they doing over here? It's misplaced. It's not misplaced. As a matter of fact, this was the whole goal. The whole goal was to get to this mm-hmm. in order to bring the world uh, 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 to the rectification, where, which is very, very flattering between me and you. If you think about it, what is God saying? I want to live with you. That's a big compliment. What Allah says, well, I don't want to live in heaven with the angels. What Allah has options to live wherever he wants. He could live in heaven, or he could live on earth. If you ask me, it's in heaven, Eden, the weather's always good, there's, uh, there's no Rishayim, Rishayim are in Gehenam, but Borei stays next to the Tzaddikim, uh, it's a good existence, and that's Borei uh, that's the element Borei Olam would want to be with. He says, no, the angels, this is not my, uh, my uh, choice of residence. I really want to live with the people, but the people have to make me, uh, they have to be hospitable. They have to make the world inviting that when I come down, I have a uh, place to be. So the Jewish people, through their service in building the Mishkan, were able to accomplish that. And that's really uh, the Geula. So the, the book ends in Sefer, Vayakel Pekudeh, where it says, Shekhinah came down, and that's it. Now we can say, uh, we did it. Mission accomplished. Are, are we clear, Rabotai, in the introduction? We didn't say anything yet. This is just a petichat ha'ichal in order to open up what we're going to come and talk about today. It's a very simple shi'ud. I have one question. I have one answer. Then I'm going to wish you Shabbat Shalom. I'll be on my way. You'll be on your way. And that's it. We'll see you, uh, you know, Shabbat. That's it. It's very easy. Here's my question. I just explained to you the goal. The goal was Vasulim Mikdash with Shachanti Betucham. That's the goal that we're trying to accomplish now in the next four parashiyot. Terumat, Tetzabeh, Vayakir, Pekudeh. And that's the Takhlit. That's the goal and the purpose of the Exodus. And that's been the goal since the time God created the world. If you look in God's office in heaven, the mission statement. You know, you go to an office outside the business, they have a mission statement. So all the workers, when they come in, they know exactly what they're supposed to do. So it says, to create a widget that the people need and sell it for a profit. That's, that's the goal over here. To make money and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, to, to make the customer happy. That's the goal. So everybody comes into the office every day, they see the mission statement. If you go into God's office, what does it say? The goal is... That's the whole goal of the whole world. That's all I want. That's why I created the world. I had a house already. But he created a second residence. And he prefers his second residence over the original residence. Of course. So it was the case. That's why we're in Florida. What do you think? So the question. How's that? Before you get to questions, it's not Pesach. We didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. Questions. We didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. So now, so now, we explain like this. Again, if I was writing Parashat Tiruma, I would have written it like this. And God says to Moshe, and I would begin, State the goal. State the purpose. State the mission statement. Abotai, we are now involved in a in a project, in the initiative, one of the most grand and one of the most lofty initiatives ever embarked as a people, and that is we're trying to bring the world back to the way it was in the times of the Avot, and that's the goal. And then the question is, how do we get to that? Then I would say, Adabera Bnei Yisrael, Chodi Terumah. To take donations, 
and we have to collect some money, and you can have some gold, and some silver, and we're going to build this Mishkan. But why does the Perasha begin? Take donations. That's not the goal to take donations. The taking of the donations is a means to get the So when you when, when the Torah is introducing the Mishkan, it should tell me the objective. Speak to the people, the Bene Bene Israel, and here's the goal. Next pasuk. How are we going to get there? Oh, we're going to need some gold. We're going to need some silver. We're going to need some nechoshet. We're going to need some uh, 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 contributions. We're going to need some uh, uh, some handiwork. We're going to need some volunteers. Instead, what does the Torah say? Speak to the people and tell them, this is what we need. We need money. Okay, that's, a, that's an old speech. That's an old derash. <laughs> and then after we need the money, they say, oh, by the way, let me tell you why we need the money. Oh, let me make it simple so I can speak English. If I'm getting up to make an appeal, and I come along and I say, Botai, we need money. We need dollars. We need shekelim. We need pesos. We need dinarim. We need rial. We need all currencies. And I'm talking for 15 minutes on all the currencies we need. And people say, well, what is he collecting for? What, 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 what is he collecting for? What's the... And then at the end, the last minute, oh, Rabotai, uh, I'm trying to build a, a mishkan. Well, he went backwards. He should start with Rabotai. We have a great project. Project Mishkan. Project mm-hmm. Mishkan. Mm-hmm. Uh, to that end, we're going to need. Is uh, it clear uh, the question? <coughs> no, don't fake. Don't, don't nod your head and then when you walk outside, I understand the question. I was talking about that. That's an easy question. Though. If you don't understand the question, speak now. If ever hold your peace. Don't do me any favors by nodding your head like Sarah Mashkim. <laughs> and you come along to say, yes, he's right. And then I'm way out to say, ah, yeah, that's a silly question. I believe it's a very strong question. So let's begin, let's begin the analysis. So the first item in the, uh, in the uh, Mishkan, of course, is the Aron. We start with the Aron. The Aron is the Ark. If you go to Perich Hafei, Pasuk Yud, Ve'asu Aron, Ase Shittim. And the Ramban points out that when it comes to all the other vessels in the Mishkan, it's written in singular. Ve'asita, Ve'asita, Ve'asita. When it comes to the Aron, Ve'asu. Ve'asu is plural. Which means the Aron becomes over here a group effort. And the Ramban's Lashon is, Yahzor el Bnei Yisrael, Ve'asu is to the people. And he comes along and says, Ve'yitachen, Sh'yirmoz, Sh'yayu kol Yisrael mishtatefim ba'asiyat Aron. When it comes to the Aron, exactly, you need full participation by the entirety of the people. Something that you don't need by the other items. By the other items, even the Mizbeah, the Menorah, uh, the Kirashim and all that, you could commission one or two people, that's your job. Report back to us, you make a subcommittee, when the Kirashim are ready, when they're plated, when they're fixed, we're gonna to go to Moshe for quality control, and look at them, see if they're, to, they're made to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the spec, to the proper is the size and so on, and we move on. When it comes to the Aron, that's already what we call a group effort. So he says, Ba'avur shehu kadosh mishkene alyon. That's the main item. That's the main piece of furniture of the Bet Mikdash. V'shiyizku kolam la Torah. Since the Aron represents Torah, and Torah is not something that belongs to an individual, belongs to the people. So for the people, in order to merit to have the zikhut of the Torah, so they have to be connected. Why, when it comes to all the other vessels, it says Vasita? Let everybody come and be, participate with the construction of the Aron. They should merit 
what the Aaron represents. And the Aaron represents Torah. Rabbi Bahia points out that why is it called an Aaron? What's the shortage of the word Aaron? The shortage is Or. Because what's in the Aaron? The Or. What's the Or? Oraita. Oraita is the Torah. So therefore, a, 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 a box that contains within it light, what do we call that? A light box. Not the light box that your wives check the uh, the lettuce for uh, for bugs. That's a different type of light box. The Aron is the real original light box that actually is containing inside of it the Aron, the Edut, the Oraita, the Torah Kedusha. Then he comes along and he says, how is it going to be possible that everybody's going to participate in the Aron? How is it How is it just physically possible? So the mind gives three ways. Va'esek. First of all, everybody has to make a donation. It's interesting. When it came to all the other items, uh, it was volunteer, and everybody could donate to what they want to donate. But when they went to collect, they said, "Make sure you give a little piece of gold, so you're part of the uh, you're part of the aron." Or, or let's say God doesn't have gold; he doesn't have money. Ya azon when you see Bitzalel building the Mishkan, walk up to him and say, listen, I want to, give, give me a job. Go, I, I, I want to help. So it means, physically. And thirdly, how, how many people, 600,000 people are going to help Bitzalel? Then it doesn't become a help anymore. It becomes a, it becomes a, 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 a distraction. It becomes interference. Oh, she chavenu ledavar. Amazing. Then Abad says, even the kabana. That even at the time that they were building the Aron, if the people's intent, if their minds were focused to the Aron, so exactly it's enough. It's been tremendous hadush. So there's three ways that Amban says the people participated collectively, either with their physical gold donations, either with their physical help to Bitzalel, or mentally, when they were building the Aron, the people's minds were on Aron. If you came to somebody during the time they were building the Aron. Uh, he tells me, no, 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 we notice an anomaly that exists by the Aron that doesn't exist by any of the other Kelim. And that is, Asita Aron, Asishiti. And now the Torah gives us the measurements. Amataim, Bahetsi, Urko. Ve'ama, Bahetsi, Ruhbo. Ve'ama, Bahetsi, Komato. So the measurements are two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. And what do all the measurements have in common? Half, half, half. No other vessel in the Mishkan has all half measurements. The Shulchan has a half measurement, but the rest of the measurements are whole measurements. So we can even learn from the measurements, Hadushim. That shows you how deep the Torah is, which means if somebody comes into my house and they see my... uh, my house, how, how big is your house, by the way? I tell them uh, it's uh, 40 by 100. Wow, 40 by 100. 40 is gematria, man, that's good. Well, so there's no, there's nothing to do. That, that, that's the lot. That, that, there's no hadushim on this over. That's the size they, the city, when they parceled out lots. I cannot start giving you hadushim, and then I walk to my bedroom. Wait, is this bedroom 8 by 10? I don't believe it. <laughs> And then you start saying, well, the eight represents Brit Mila, and the ten represents Asit the Bir. That's nothing to do. It's, it's, that's the size of the room. No. But when you come to build the Mishkan, since who made up these measurements? So you're right. You cannot do that in my house and start making Hadushim, even if I made it up. But I wasn't thinking of anything. I was just thinking to maximize the space. That's the more covenant. Actually, I was just trying to make my wife happy, to be honest with you. That's, that's the only covenant. That's it. So all the measurements in homes are based on Shalom Bayit. However, when God is building his Mishkan and he says, the Aron, I want it to be one and a half, two and a half, one and a half. Well, you could have picked any measurement. 
So never we're able to ask what's these half measurements. So the Balatunim says what he says. We'll read it. Oh, all the measurements of the Mishkan are broken. Hatsi. Mahatsae Amot. What does that teach you? Lelamed. She called me Shilometora. Sarich Lishbor ul Hashpil Atzmo. In order for Torah to be uh, absorbed in the person, he has to be a half measure, which teaches us the inyan of humility. If a person thinks he's a whole measure, he thinks he's perfect, he has ga'ava, <coughs> so then the light of the aron will not be able to shine on the person. And therefore the measurements of the aron are teaching you one of the qualities that are needed as a prerequisite in order that the knowledge that's in the Aron will be able to be absorbed in the person's mind. And what is that? Hatsi, Hatsi, Hatsi. Anaba. We know that already. One of the 48 ways to acquire Torah is humility, which is a key thing. And we know Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble of all men. That's why he was the greatest of all men. There's a direct correlation between Moshe's excessive humility and Moshe's excessive greatness in Torah. You can draw a a corollary. There was a, a connection. And the more humble, the more great. And there was one rabbi in the Gemara, it says, Rabbi Yoshua in Hananya, he was uncomely. He was, I'm going to say the word, he was ugly. He didn't have a good appearance. But he was a great Tamid Hakam. And uh, he said, uh, somebody once asked him, one of the, the princess asked him, uh, uh, you have such glorious wisdom yeah, in such an ugly right. vessel. So he said, yeah, he said, if I would be uglier, I would be even more smarter. Yeah. Which means, uh, and if the rabbis over there who are, who are handsome, if they would be more uncomely, what's the explanation? Because <coughs> they're humble. So there's the inyan of humility and Torah. That's a simple explanation of Balaturim. So far, so good? Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you when we start. We didn't start yet. This is all preparing for the derash but you see some people they get right to the when, when you have deal let me teach you how to give a derash when you tell a, a story you don't go right to the to, to the punchline you make a derash you give a story you go over here you go over there so you make it rich you make it rich so the people get their money's worth and then when they're already thirsty and you're getting their attention, then you start to give them the... Uh, some people that come to tell the joke, they give the punchline right away. But you ruined the whole uh, item. So you shouldn't say, hey, the guy's talking for 20 minutes and he, he didn't say anything yet. Which means he didn't give us the item yet. No, this is all... When you go to a restaurant, they bring out the steak first? No, they bring out the salad, they bring out some soup, <laughs> they bring out some... Guy. Yeah, no, the steak's coming. You have to, you have to, you have to pace yourself. But they always bring out the what your appetite. So that's what we do in Derash as well. That's just for the guys who are interested in knowing the, the, the style. Look at the Kliyakar. I'm not going to read it to you now. But the Shabbat is long. This week the Shabbat is at least 25 hours. Go read the Kliyakar over Shabbat. And you're going to see over here, he brings the Mazim on all the measurements and the uh, 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 configuration of the of the, of the Aron. Ayin Shabbat. It's a good uh, homework. But we came today to bring to your attention what a rabbi that's called Zerah Kodesh said. There was a rabbi, the Admon Merofshitz, one of the Hasidic masters. He wrote a sefer called Zerah Kodesh. And he weighs in on the Aron, its half measurements, the collectiveness of it, the asu, and why does it come first before everything else? So I'm going to explain to you what he says. He says like this. What does HaKadosh Baruch Hu want from the people? Why didn't he just create us in heaven and we go straight up to heaven? Why aren't there no direct flights from Kisei Kavod to Gan Eden? Why do you have to make a stopover, a long stopover, and all that was there, and then go back up. It's a V. You go back up, down, and then you, you go back up. Why not? Why can't it be a straight line? So he explains that. Listen, because Borei Olam, he puts the person into a world of, of tests, of nisyonot, and he gives the person weaknesses and handicaps and you know things that he has to struggle with. 
because there's no greater item that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has pleasure in and when a person breaks himself, when a person is able to overcome his, his desire and break his tendencies to what our alam, because why is he doing that? He's doing it for God. And that's the hardest thing for a person to do. The easiest thing for a person to do is act like he was born. A person's born with a short fuse, so therefore, the easiest thing for him to do is get angry every day. And when somebody comes and says, why are you always getting angry? That's where I was born. Why is a man with black skin have black skin? Can a leopard change his, change his height? Of course not. So therefore, a person thinks that he's born a miser. A person's born with gava. A person's born with a love of money. A person has a desire for woman. These are all natural things. People have the desires. A person has yes and but the goal is, and the belief is, you can break it. Mm-hmm. You have to know that. And that's what Borei Olam wants. He created us with imperfections, with the specific intent to give you the ability to break your imperfection and break the thing that's the greatest test to you, your greatest weakness, can become the greatest gift you can give to God. Mm-hmm. Says the Sefer the Hainu. Where do we learn this from? Borei Olam created us men I'm talking about now, with a foreskin, the orla. So what happens on the eighth day? We have a brit. Says the simple, what's the purpose of the brit? Why does God create us with an imperfection and then tell us to take it off? A person, uh, he, buys a, uh, he buys a suit. And uh, he sticks his hand in the suit and there's all uh, thorns. There's all thorns in the suit. He goes back to this the guy in the store. He said, what is this? I put my hand in. I got, oh, look. No, no, that, you have to remove it. <clears throat> oh, anyway, you have to remove it. Don't put it there, so I would have to remove it. What, what, what did you put an impediment in my suit? That a guy cuts his hand off. Oh, that's, the, that's the minag. You buy the suit. Before you put it on, you take out all the thorns that are in the, in the wool, and then you put it on. You couldn't do that for me? No. We want you to do it. So, but all that, we asked the similar, I knew. You knew we had to take off the orla. So why create us with the orla is that we should remove it, just create us already removed. You're right, it, it, it'll put the mohels out of business, but let them become a sofer, let them, let them become a shokhet. There's other, there's other jobs for them. The party planners are not going to like it, the caterers will not be happy in doing away with a major uh, party, but that's not our concern. The concern is why create us with orla if it's going to be removed anyway. And what is the Sefer Hanukh answer? He says something beautiful. He says, to God, God is sending a message to every person. That even though you were created with a handicap and a, and a weakness, it's in your ability to bring yourself to perfection. Just like you were able to bring your physical body to perfection by removing the orla, so to all the other imperfections that you have. And all the other weaknesses that you have, it is in your ability, just like you did on the eighth day, the orla was removed from you, you can do that as well. So that, that, that's almost like a, a, a mission. What Yawlam says, from the eighth day on, whatever you did on this day, they blessed them at the Brit Milah. We say, just like you entered the Brit, which is the lesson of the Brit is what? that you were able to bring yourself to perfection, so you should do that the rest of your life in all other areas. And you shouldn't come along and say, well, if I was born in Orla, I'm born with it, what can I do? What can you do? Cut it off. And if you're born with other uh, challenges that are difficult to you, so you have to cut it off. Work on yourself. The Gaon of Vilna says, a person came into this world for one reason, to break his midot. Mm-hmm. He says this in, in the Ibn Shilema. And then he rises to the language of the government of Vilna. And if a person comes into this world and is not involved in breaking his character and perfecting himself, he says the following three words. Lama lo haim. He shouldn't be born. What's, what's, what's he doing? What's he doing here? What, what, why was he born? The whole purpose of this world is to perfect yourself. And that's what Borei Olam created. And that, as I'll show you from the Rambam, is one of the greatest pleasures that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has. More than anything, what does God need? Money? No. 
When Borei Olam sees Mesirut Nefesh, that person has a desire and he breaks it. <coughs> Borei Olam says, that's for me. That's the greatest gift you can give to Hashem. I once said at a wedding, you know, at a wedding, at the end of the ceremony, they break a glass. <coughs> Many reasons have been said why they break the glass. But I like to say at the wedding is the following reason. You know, when a person uh, gets married, so one of the hardest challenges of marriage is you have to transition from being a bachelor. And a bachelor, if you look in the, in the, the, in the dictionary, the synonym for bachelor is selfish. That's what a bachelor means. It means a selfish person. Of course. You don't have to give to anybody. All the bachelors takes for himself. He takes for himself. All the money is for himself. He doesn't have to give anything. His father's paying all the bills usually. His mother makes all the food. And he just comes home like a melech and he just takes for everything. And when they ask him to do something, I'm too busy. Ask him, I'm busy. What are you asking me for? Ask my brother. Ask my sister. So the bachelor, the selfish guy. And all of a sudden now he gets married. And now all of a sudden he's got he's got he's got to give. All of a sudden, his wife said, where's my allowance? Where's your allowance? He never gave allowance in his life. All the kids, his whole life is taking allowance. Now, all of a sudden, he has to put his hand in his pocket. Now, all of a sudden, he, he, has, to, he has to shell out some money. All of a sudden, now, his wife tells him, make sure you're home by 7 o'clock. We have dinner. I mean, nobody tells me to come home over here. I come home whenever I come home. There's no curfew. It was over here when the martial law. I have to come home at 7 o'clock. Now, you have to deal with somebody. Now, you have to... When you when you wake up in the morning now, you can't open the lights to get dressed anymore. You have to keep the lights closed so you don't wake up the rabbits in. You have to be careful. Oh, that's yeah, it. Yeah. And you have to you have to put the toothpaste back in the drawer oh, now. Yeah. You can't leave the toothbrush on the on the cat anymore. You can't even leave your dirty clothes on the floor like an animal anymore. Now you have to you know, get there with So all of a sudden you have to break your, your nature. That's why I said the Pasuk says in the Torah, Al Ken Azov Ish et Aviv. So the Pasuk says, A person should leave his, his parents' house. Now, what, what does that mean? We don't leave our parents' house ever. What it means, you should leave the attitude that you had in your parents' house. In your parents' house, you were selfish. All you did is what? <laughs> You're taking. Leave that position of selfishness. And now you have to turn into a, a giver. That means marriage is turning yourself from a taker into a giver. That's the whole thing of marriage. But that's, that's a lot of work. You have to break yourself in a lot of different areas in order to extend yourself to somebody else. So in Hebrew... The word for nature is what? Teva. Teva. What's teva mean? Your nature. At a wedding, we take a course. I've said many times, sometimes I was at a wedding in Manhattan. I'm the officiating rabbi, so I have to make sure that everything is uh, is, is proper. The officiating rabbi is like the uh, pilot in the, in the cockpit. He has to make sure that uh, everything is, is, is good. He's not just there to make a beracha. He's there to make sure the ceremony is Kedat Moshe Israel. So I always look on the table to see the sure The wine is there, the besamim is there, and the, and the glass. I thought it's to break the glass. Sometimes the party plan is, because they're so smart, they put a, a light bulb. So I feel it, I feel it, it's a light bulb. So I tell the party plan, hey, what, what is this over here? No, no, this is okay. Who told you? What, 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 yeshiva? <laughs> what yeshiva did you learn and that you're telling me this is okay? I don't tell you how to party plan. You don't tell me how to miss the Kedushin. I don't want a light bulb. I want a glass. So she tells me, what's the difference? Now you want a shiur now? And under the chuppah? Come to my house, I'll give you a shiur for three and a half hours when it has to be a glass now. Now is not the time to ask questions. Now your response should be, Na'azim and Ishma. Go get me a glass. But it's a safety. So she argued. Let me fail. I can do it myself. Shilohoshil Adam, Kimoto. Kimoto means like he's dead. So therefore, I get a glass. What's the difference? But maybe she's right. It's easier to break a, a light bulb, that's for sure. Explanation is, because what's, what's the purpose and the function of a course? 
the whole to vessel. receive to receive that's a bachelor mm. and therefore the last thing before he becomes married is he has to break the course wow you're not a receiver anymore finished you break that item of selfishness and therefore we break that that you can't say that by a light bulb <laughs> you can't, on the contrary a light bulb is purpose to give so if you're gonna break a light bulb you're breaking the the, the, the selflessness you're doing the, you're doing the opposite and Kos is 86, and the word Teva is 86. To teach the person to break your Teva, you're breaking the Kos. Kos kematria Teva. We're telling the Atan, that's the purpose of marriage, that you have to work on yourself now, and usually by, if, 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 if you start, when the time you get married, usually it's too late. Usually you have to start working, you know, much before in order to prepare yourself for those, for those moments. And that's what Borei Olam desires, and that's the, and that's what's the first mitzvah of the Torah to get married, because that's the whole purpose of the world. Break us, and through marriage, it's a great uh, exercise and training to overcome to overcome your weaknesses. Oh, so if that's the case, says the the Zera Kodesh, this is beautiful. He writes, "The Asu Aron Aseshitim." The word shitim. Shitim is wood. Acacia wood. Huh? Okay. So now, the explanation is like this. Says the Rav, says the Rav, the whole goal of learning Torah and studying Torah and connecting yourselves to Torah because Torah is the force that's able to break the nature. If you think you're going to do this alone by reading some, some self-help book, the guy's going to go to uh, uh, Barnes and Nobles and you're going to read all these secular books, self-help, how to overcome. And if it doesn't have Torah in it, it's not going to work. Barati yetzerara, barati lo Torah tevalin. Don't look for new, uh, you know, uh, uh, secular or or synthetic uh, uh, substitutes for the Torah. There's only one. There's only one method here. Now, the Gemara says, if the Yetzirah is made out of rock, nimoah. What does that mean? Even if the person's he's so set in his ways, like a rock, you can't change the guy. Guys, uh, guys, like a, he's 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 hard as a rock. The guy, you can't move him. You're right. Take some Torah, pour it on it, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you see Nimoah. The guy becomes swift. As we see, the people that start to learn Torah, they transform. They change. But if you think that, no, I'll just do some, uh, you know, uh, 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 Dale Carnegie, I'll read a book, and I'll read another book from some other guy that's an inspirational speaker, and another guy that has, uh, you know, some, some good ideas. He speaks at the conventions and at, uh, at, uh, at different type of, uh, you know, business uh, 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 motivational uh, gatherings. You guys think it's not what time. Barati Yetzirara, Barati Torah Tevalin. God says, I created the Yetzirara. You're going to tell me how to get rid of him? I'm the manufacturer. So who knows better than the manufacturer? God forbid. One time in the Israelis, they went after this guy, Mash'al. They went into Lebanon, wherever they went, and they tried to kill him. They put, they put poison in his ear. Anyway, it was a foiled uh, attempt. They caught the guys who did it, and this guy, he was in a coma, and they said, you better send us the antidote. So Israel had to send the... Uh, the medicine that neutralizes the poison. Because whenever you make a poison, you always make a, an antidote first. Just in case uh, you know, the wrong uh, guy gets it, you want to save him. Anyway, they sent them the antidote. Why did they call Israel for the antidote? Because they made the poison. Why don't you call China? We're going to give you now. We're going to give you uh, COVID uh, medicine. We're going to give you. They're going to make the guy more sick. The point is, the, the one that creates the poison, he knows exactly the, the antidote. And sure enough, they flew it on a private jet to uh, Jordan. 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 Jordan, it was Jordan, exactly. And they gave it to him. Sure enough, mm-hmm. he, he's alive still. He, he survived it. So what Alam says, I created this poison over here called the Yetzirara. So you're going to go tell me now, Barnes and Noble has the Nefuah? Good luck. Go try. I hope the Yetzirara doesn't kill you by the time you finish reading all the books in Barnes and Nobles. I'm giving you the antidote. 
The antidote is what? Torah. Torah. Finished. Barati hits up to it. So you gotta learn. Learning has the ability to break a person. There's no other option, the Putai. Remember that. And therefore, the Rav learns like this. If you take the word Shittim, Sheen, Tet, is 309. Yud is what? 10. 10. That's 319. And 40 is Mem. So Shittim equals 359. Of course, that number doesn't mean anything to you. Says the Rav, Shittim is Gematria Satan. Shittim is Gematria Satan. And you know why we call the Satan Shittim? Because based on the Gemara Sota, page 3, the Gemara there says that any time a person makes a sin, for sure, Nichnas Bo Ruach Shitut. It's temporary insanity. To rebel against God, it's, it, it, it's Ruach Shitut. So therefore, anybody that's involved in Avera is involved in Ma'ase Shittim. You're involved in, in Shitut. So therefore, the Satan is also 359. Satan, seen. Tet nun. Satan gematria shitim because ma'ase satan is ma'ase shitut. But what's the advice? So he says, how do you say advice in Hebrew? Oh, so therefore you, you, you say aitza. Uh, so it says, ma'asu aron. Make for yourself an aron. What's the aron? That's the light box that holds the Torah. And you know what the aron really is? Atzeh. It's the Aitza, it's the advice, Shittim, Atzeh Shittim. It's the advice to overcome Ma'ase Shtut of the Yitzhak Ara. Atzeh Shittim. That's the depth of Atzeh Shittim. You learned Atzeh Shittim, a piece of wood. Okay, good luck. With no fruit. With no fruit. But now we're learning Atzeh Shittim differently from the Zera uh, Kodesh. Atzeh Shittim, it's Aitza. Listen, somebody comes to the Rabbi, Rabbi my Yitzhak is old. Taken over. I don't know what to do. I need Aitza. Atse Shittim? Yes, I need Atse Shittim. I need Atse Shittim. And the answer is Vasu Aron. Vasu Aron. Make for yourself. And this is something everybody must do. There's nobody that can come in the world and say, you know, Baruch Hashem, I'm perfect. You had a Brit Mila? Yes, you're not perfect. Now, the guy said, I was born Mahul. Okay, maybe the guy was born Mahul. We have to deal with that guy over there. That's a rare case over there. But even that guy needs a uh, We have to do something. So therefore, why do you need the Torah? So look what he says. All the midot of the Aron are what? Broken. What is a midah? A measurement. But what is also a midah? Exactly. And therefore it's teaching you the only way to break your midot. Broken midot. You have to break yourself. The only way to break yourself is Vasu Aron. That's the Atse Shitim. And what will the accomplishment be? It'll have the ability to break your midot, to break the glass at the wedding. It'll shatter your midot. You'll be able to change. That means the only way to reach transformation, to become different, which is Shivirata Midot, which the Gomer Villa said, if you're not involved in that, you're involved in nothing, is Aron. So that's why. It comes first to Arun, because that's the goal. If you're not involved in this, so what are you doing? A guy once came to the shoot of Rabbi Yehuda Ades. Oh, it's late already. We got time. You're making the case for everybody. You have time, I have to go. What do you have to have to with baby? I came to Florida. I came to babysit you the whole day now. It's the babysit. You're making the case for everybody participating in the Now watch. I came to babysit. So now, the explanation over here is, explanation over here is, so the, the guy, Rabbi Ades, was giving a shoot on Kaas. Anger. So a 75-year-old guy came after him and said, this shiur doesn't talk to me. Why not? He said, because I'm a kasan. Does it mean so? It should talk to you more than anybody. No, 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 no. I was born that way. So Rabbi Adis said, what a shame. The guy doesn't know. 75 years, he thought because his father was angry and his grandfather was angry. He's from the Shevet HaKa'az Kasanim. He thought that he's predisposed. He says, Hava, the guy didn't realize he could change. How much misery would he save himself if he realized that he'd be able to and the only way to overcome would have been through the study of Torah Atzeh Shittim that's the Itza against Shittim so now watch now we go back we go back we go back 
באיזה רמב״ם. רמב״ם איזה הלכות איסורי המזבח. פרק ז'. He's talking about over here the different types of menachot, flower, meal offerings that you can bring. There's all different types of menachot, but they're all kosher. So the Ramad says, if they're all kosher, what does the Torah have to list them all? So he says, no, you have to list them. Kedei lida yafeh she'en lemala memenu. So you have to know that there are better ones. There's more expensive ones. Vashave vapachot. You have to know the value. There's certain ones that are more expensive than menachot, and certain them are cheaper. Now watch what he says. Sharotse lezakot atzmo. The person wants to have a merit. Yachuf yitzro. Let him break his yitzrara. Viyarchiv yado. And let him be generous. Viyavi korbano. Which means, he doesn't just say you need to know the level of the Korban so you know to bring the best. What's the, what's the purpose of bringing the best? Why is bringing the best? Because it's more expensive. He's because usually people, when they have something, they don't want to give it, they keep it for themselves. So by giving the best Korban Tashem, what is it going to do? Tashem, it's going to do nothing. Trust me, Hashem doesn't care if you give him a fat animal or you give him a couple of grains of flour. Hashem is the same thing. Hashem owns the whole world. He cares if he gets a big animal or a small. But what is it going to do to the person? The Rambam's not shown is Sharosel lizkot atzmo yachuf yitzro to break his yetzer. Because normally the yetzer says what? Keep the best for yourself. Give God the secondary. Like, like Cain in heaven. That's what you're giving to God. You're giving God your Broke yourself. That's the best korban you can give. Any time a person has a desire and he puts his head down, or he closes his mouth, or he doesn't eat, or he doesn't react, you can't imagine. That's the greatest mm-hmm. thing that you can deliver. Yahuf et Yitzro. Otherwise, what does Hashem want? This is what he wants. Now we go back to the original question. What's the hardest part of the building of the Mishkan? Lifting money. Hazaka Baruch. Not the collecting of it. I guess you're right. The donating of it. <clears throat> and more than the donating of it, but actually paying it. Once the money is collected, you should build it. But what is the energy that builds the Mishkan? It's the Misiru Nefesh of the people, they just made a lot of money. Now he asks them, give us your zahab, give us your kesef, give us your nehoshet. Most people, a lot of people I should say, they're possessed of their money. So when it comes to the mishkan, nehoshet, there's nehoshet, there's your, the copper, but you have gold. <coughs> there's tuition, future, you know, college, all this business over here. And therefore, they give to God, but they give the minimum, Borei Olam says, I want to see if you can break yourself. If you can afford the Zahab, give the Zahab. If you can give the Kesef, fine, give the Kesef. The hardest thing is to give. So therefore, when the Torah begins its discussion, it doesn't start Ba'asudi Mikdash. Ba'asudi Mikdash, of course, is the result. But that's not the goal. You know what the goal is? Break yourself. Get together, overcome your desires. If you do this, it'll result in Basuli Mikdash. But Borea Olam says, I'm telling you what I desire. That means the desire of Akhir Baruch is what? The actual performance of the of the of, of the mitzvah of Sadaqah in this case, or for that matter, any mitzvah where it hurts you, where you had to overcome a certain and therefore that's what God takes. And that's why Borei Olam mentions it. If you look in the book of, of, of Vayakel, in Vayakel, where it reviews, what was the Pasuk say? In Vayakel, it says, Vayakel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Yisrael, and he tells them, Zeha davar she ta'ase, ki hu me'etechem metech, teruma, kol nediv lev yevi'eha, zahab ha'chesed, rochoshed, rochel v'argaman, orotelim, odamim, shemen ha'maor, besamim, 
Nowhere over here does it say Ma'asudim Mikdash. In Bayakel Estayu, that was the objective. The objective was to see if the people were able to break their materialistic desires, their physical pleasures, and to give, even if it hurt. That's what Borei that, that, That's what we receive now. If you do that, of course, Ma'asudim Mikdash Kamei Dukham. The result is going to be the the Asubi. But what did Borei Olam? crave in this whole exercise of the building of the Mishkan. The process. The process is the key. My question originally was, just tell us, tell us about the end. I thought originally, process is not purposeful. The process is just to get there. But now you're learning the journey as well is what Hashem desires. I'm saying again to make it clear. My question was on the wrong premise. My question was based on, what are you wasting your time on the journey for? The purpose is Vasudi Mikdash. So collecting the money is just the way you get there. No. It's a means within itself. The means within itself. When Alam saw the people that just came out of Mitzrayim, and they were working on their Madre God, and they were overcoming this. That's why, for example, the Orach Kadosh, the Orach Kadosh, when he lists... He says the Torah lists Zahav, Kesef, Nehoshet. It lists, I don't know how many, 15 or 16 different. 13. Or oh, 13, I, I, I didn't count. It's 15. Some people say 15, some people say 13. It's okay, amazing. so there's inflation. But the point is, <laughs> but the point is, if you look at the at the list, the last item on the list is what? Abne Shoham. The, the stones. Yes. So Rahim Kadosh asks, why is that the last on the list? So he comes along and he says something beautiful. Look what he writes. The <laughs> ordinary. According to what it says in Yomah 75, Where did Abne Shoham come from, these rocks? Where did they get these special stones? It says the clouds somehow brought these stones from a remote area and they, it rained, it rained these stones. That's the, in those days before Amazon. They had the clouds. The clouds would deliver a, a material. Just like the clouds delivered the man. So they needed these stones. But they needed it for the Mishkan. Where are you going to get it from? So the Ananim came. So he says, Im ken, Mishulchan gabu'ayu mev'im, Belo Torah v'yigi'ah. There was no Torah. There was no, there was no exertion. They didn't have to work to give it. And therefore, put that the last on the list. It might have been the most precious, but since it didn't take any effort. And where was it coming from? It's coming from heaven. Nobody was out of pocket. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like somebody had to go to their bank and take money that they had. They didn't go into the jewelry box and have to take their, you know, their jewelry. It was a windfall. It came from heaven. And okay, anyway, the, you know, we, 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 didn't, we didn't take it yet into our possession. Come on, take it. What Ayman <laughs> Kadosh says, the most expensive of all the items was the least important. Because it's not the item. What's what I'm looking for? We said today. The effort. the effort. He's looking for the person to break his desire for the Hatsim Midah. And therefore, the item that had the easiest, the easiest donation to give is the least significant. And the donation that's the hardest to give is the most significant. That's why the Bible Tunim says, and we'll conclude with this. Pasuk writes, Zahab v'chesef un'choshet. And the rabbis learn that there's three levels in people that give tzedakah. One guy's a gold. Can we see in the journal? The gold uh, guy? Gold. $5,000. And kesef, kesef is $2,600. And then the choshet is the guy in the back. One line, 26 bucks. They put, put, a, you know, put his business card on. <laughs> so now the Balatulim says there's three types of givers. One guy he gives when he's healthy. That guy we call him Zahav. Zehan noten bari. There's another guy when he's healthy he doesn't give. When he starts to get sick, God forbid, or he starts to see things are getting dangerous, so they tell him, oh, it's a can I give Rabbi Meir Balanes, give the rabbi. And then there's another guy, even the Sakana, he don't care, he's not giving nothing. 
only when he's on his own deathbed. He can't even give himself. He has to tell other people to give. Nehoshet netinat holeh sheomer tenu. The giving of a sick man that says to other people to give. Now, I always understood that the reason why it's a, a, a lower level is the following. When a guy's giving when he's sick, <coughs> why is he giving? Exactly. So that's not, uh, uh, that's really self-preservation. It's not giving, it's taking. It's it's not it's not exactly. They tell me, if you give, you know, so therefore... Uh, quid pro quo. Uh, quid pro quo, guy's getting something. Of course you're going to give. The Shalom says, uh, w- won't the person give to save his life? So therefore, that's a, it's a giving, but actually you're yeah. putting from one pocket to, to the other pocket. You gi- you're giving the tzedakah so you can live, so you can make more money. So you know, that's not a missing image. But who's the best giver? He's healthy. So what's motivating him to give? He has all the money. He doesn't need any reason for it. He doesn't need stakat mavid. He doesn't have any sakana. Everything is... What's the motivation then? That's the hardest to give. When you don't have a... Just give for what? Usually a guy gives me a check for so there's 42 refuah he gave me a whole grocery list he gave me instructions for 52 bucks I have 30, 52 instructions <laughs> <laughs> so therefore okay very good but what motivated the, another guy gives me a thousand dollars what is this for nothing what do you mean nothing just, what do you want for it I want nothing for it Baruch Hashem I'm happy I'm successful I'm doing good wow that you have to break yourself to give the money even though you're getting nothing Nothing in return. That's why he's Zahav. Because there's no ulterior motives behind this giving. That's a much harder giving. It's much easier to give, it's much easier for us to give at a Chinese auction where I can win. <laughs> so that, I like that type of sedaka. I'm going to be a raffle ticket. I'm a raffle. Give me 100 raffles. <laughs> because there's a chance I can win $10,000. Even if I don't win, but at least, uh, listen, not every stock you win money also, but it's an investment. <coughs> but just to give with my name. How big are the letters going to be? What's the uh, what, 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 what's the what, the plaque? I'm not saying you shouldn't give in those situations, of course. But if we're talking about a gold giver, gold giver, somebody doesn't that. I'm going because Hashem wants me to give, and it's the hardest to give like that. You're getting nothing back. You're getting nothing back, and you really didn't have to give for your own. Per- you just give it for the other guy, so he can have a benefit. And you take nothing in return. <laughs> Bori Alam says, that's a giving. That's a siddhaka. That's gold. And that's why the perasha begins not with the result, with, with the process, with the journey, because that's the whole goal. And uh, don't think that this doesn't apply to us, because you're going to say, well, it's a shame because we don't have a mishkan today. Look how at the end of the construction, what does the pasuk say? Asuli Mikdash. Whatever I'm showing you, all the structures that I showed you, and the measurements and all the construction, you should do it. That she says, the Dorot means, whatever I just told you, you should do it for the generations. What do you mean, generations? The building of the Mishkan is not a mitzvah de dorot. The building of the Mishkan is a once in a lifetime item. What's in the dorot? She's saying the principles that are set forth over here, mm-hmm. the principles that you just learned from the Mishkan, what Hashem wants. Hashem wants ultimately ba'asuli mikdash v'shakati betocham. That's the goal. And how does that happen? The journey. Whenever a person overcomes something that is difficult for him, you have to know you have just built a mishkan. You have just built a mishkan. Everybody can build their own mishkan in their own in their own lives, and then you can become also a merkaba, the shechina like the avot. If that's the case, just like sefer geula is predicated on this concept, so to the geula that we're anticipating Bezat Hashem in our time, which we'll see with our own eyes, is also predicated on this mm. concept. That what the Olam says, Ba'asuli Mikdash, but put that aside. The main thing is, Ye'chudi Tiruma, Atzeh Shittim, the Itzah to overcome the Shittim is Hatsim Midot. 
to break the midot, to break the glass at the wedding, to go from a, a giver, from a taker into a giver. And that's what Borei Olam desires. <laughs> Recording stopped.